Uh, welcome to this session. Um, I'm, uh, as you can see, a little bit of musical chairs getting the session together, but I think we're in a very, very good place right now. And as I was saying to Valley earlier, well, sorry, a very good place might not be the right way to start this uh, session. Um, uh, as the best description, given the title, Middle East Conflict, What is the Endgame? But I'm very pleased to have Vali Nasser sitting over there because uh, we'll get extra benefit of his uh, insights, which will be incredibly important. Um, and just to let you know, you will need uh, your uh, translation devices if you don't speak Arabic at, at certain moments of this session. So please make sure you have that ready. As you know, we've got about uh, 45 minutes uh, for this uh, session. Um, uh, it's on the record, I see. Yes, um, so um, uh, be aware of that as well. Um, let me do a very quick uh, introduction um, of the panelists that we have here. Um, and then I'll come back a little bit to, to how we're going to run it and some of the topics we want to cover in this very tight 45 minutes for such a, a big subject. Um, on my immediate uh, left, Major General uh, Adiris al Zubaidi. Uh, pleasure to have you with us, uh, sir, Vice President of the Presidential <laughs> Leadership Council uh, of Yemen, uh, the internationally recognized uh, government. Um, uh, to his left, Gib uh, Pedersen, uh, the UN Special Envoy for Syria. Um, but as we were discussing earlier, he's had a lot of roles uh, in the region, including um, the uh, Special Representative uh, for the government, uh, sorry, for the UN uh, to Lebanon, uh, member of the Oslo negotiating team, uh, has been Norway's special representative to the UN, um, also ambassador to China at one point as well. So uh, he will get a lot of questions, uh, I'm sure, uh, and discussion here. Um, I'm going to say my colleague, Dr. Karen von Hippel, um, as she is the Director General of the Royal United Services Institute, RUSI, um, but has a very important experience uh, as uh, concerns this topic. Used to work at CSIS in Washington, my own alma mater as well. Um, and was Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, for Conflict and Stabilization Operations in the U.S. State Department, Chief of Staff to uh, uh, General John Allen when he was uh, President's uh, Envoy to Countering ISIL, and Professor Vali Nasser, uh, who is a professor at the Paul Nitzer School, School of Advanced International Studies uh, at Johns Hopkins, former dean, uh, author, um, and uh, will really give us, I think, excellent insights, not just on the region, but also obviously on Iran. Um, I want to uh, be able to move through this subject. Let me just do a frame setting two comments um, for all of you. Uh, the first would be, we've got this title, what is the end game? But I think the end game at the moment is, uh, is this conflict spreading, clearly, or is it escalating? Yeah? Because a lot of the things that are happening at the moment, including kidnapping uh, uh, or taking of uh, vessels, uh, hitting of vessels in the uh, Straits of Hormuz, these are things that have happened in the past. Yemen has been uh, in a civil war for a very long time. But it's like all of these things are happening simultaneously. Is it spread or is it escalation that we really need to worry about? And I just wonder if you can keep that theme in mind. And then uh, if we can get towards the end of this session to what is uh, likely to be uh, the end game. Uh, can we see a future that is stable? Can we see a future that is peaceful? Uh, two very different kinds of end games, because just a few months ago, um, uh, prior to October the 7th, the sense was this was a region moving towards potentially longer term uh, stability. So um, with those uh, points in mind, let me turn first uh, uh, to you, sir, uh, Mr. Al um, uh, let's start with the first example of spread or escalation, which is the situation in Yemen. Uh, the U.S. and some of its allies have done strikes against the Houthi uh, rebels who've struck uh, ships uh, passing through uh, the Straits up uh, through to the Red Sea. Um, do you think this is going to be successful? Is it raising the prospect of an escalation of the conflict in Yemen? Or is this going to hit a new normal where um, one just has to worry the Red Sea becomes a very unpredictable route? Uh, what's your sense of the, of the current situation? And do you think these strikes are going to make a difference? Is it going to escalate? Or can we hit some type of stability? Uh, شكرا جزيلا بالنسبة لما يحصل في باب المندب بالذات من تصعيد 
من قبل الميليشيات الحوثية هو مسألة خطيرة جدا طبعا وتؤثر على حياة الناس المعيشية والإنسانية في اليمن وانقطاع الإمدادات عليهم لأن معظم السكان اليمن يعيش على أكثر من 80 إلى 90 بالمئة من من الصادرات من الخارج طبعا الغذاء والدواء والطاقة ما قام بالحوثيا هو عملية طبعا غير مقبولة والذي قامت به أو الردع بداية الردع الاستراتيجي الذي قامت بالولايات المتحدة وبريطانيا هي عملية صحيحة ونحن نطالب طبعا باستمرار هذا الردع حتى يتم يعني انهاء انهاء يعني القوة العسكرية الذي يمتلكها الحوثي والذي يؤذي بها المجتمع الإقليمي في باب المندب وهذا التصعيد يؤدي إلى تفاقم الأزمة طبعا إذا استمر بهذا الحال ولم يحصل على ردع استراتيجي وشامل تقوم به طبعا الولايات المتحدة وبريطانيا ويعني المجتمع الدولي بشكل عام والإقليمي ندعوهم إلى ردع استراتيجي ويعني توقيف ما يقوم به الميليشيات الحوثية من قرصن أو من يعني أعمال يعني يعني لا علاقة لها يعني بما يحصل في فلسطين طبعا هو يحاول أن يجذب الرأي المحلي ويزيد من شعبيته في هذه الحالة ولا علاقة طبعا لها وباب المندب طبعا ممر دولي آمن وممر يعني يهم الاقليم بشكل عام والعالم بشكل عام فهو ممر دولي وعلى المجتمع الدولي الامم المتحده والولايات المتحده الجامعه العربيه وكل الدول بالاقليم عليهم حمايه هذا الباب وعدم تركه للتصعيد الحوثي الذي يستلم توجيهاته من ايران طبعا. If I can just follow up with one question I mean it was notable that the UN uh, resolution that took place just beforehand um, uh, was not unanimous but there was abstentions from Russia, uh, from China, uh, about being deeply critical of the actions of the Houthis, telling them to stop. But countries in the region, including Saudi Arabia, maybe UAE, seem to be more cautious about the kind of military actions that the US and the UK are taking. Do you think there's, how aligned do you believe your allies in, in the region, uh, in the Gulf region are with the military action being undertaken by the US and UK in particular with the support of their allies. اعتقد ان حلفاء الولايات المتحده في المنطقه تعرضوا الى ضربات صاروخيه والطيران المسير خاصه المملكه العربيه السعوديه والامارات العربيه المتحده ولم يتحرك طبعا الاسرقه الامريكان طبعا ولا البريطانيين معهم عندما قصفت يعني حقول النفط وقصفت طبعا الرياض وابو ظبي لم يحصل تحرك وهم الان في حاله ترقب طبعا لكن المصلحة الأممية والمصلحة الأقليمية تقضي على تشكيل تحالف دولي للجم الحوثيين وضرب بنية تحتية الصاروخية والمسيرات طبعا. Thank you very much. Let me just keep moving down the line uh, gear. We're talking about, I'm talking about, uh, certainly uh, spread versus escalation. If you have something to say on the Yemen question, please do just come in on the back uh, of the comments. Uh, uh, by, by <coughs> but um, the other part of the world that we're looking at, or the region, uh, where this threat of escalation and spread is very live, obviously, is in southern Lebanon and potentially into Syria. Uh, it looks as if the Israeli government uh, is going to want sort of two buffers, a buffer somehow around Gaza, but probably now uh, the implementation of the UN resolutions to have a true buffer so it can move its citizens back to northern Israel. Um, how worried are you about sort of spread, where there is some violence, this already <coughs> shelling taking place, mm. or escalation? What's your take on that part of the world? And anything you want to say on Yemen, obviously, we welcome. Um, I'm extremely worried. Uh, I think we have both seen uh, spread and escalation. You know, if you look at the situation since the 7th of October, uh, we have seen what we before the 7th of October would have called a warlike situation yeah. between Israel and Hezbollah. Hmm? We have seen both the spread and escalation in Syria. We have seen dozens of attacks on U.S. positions inside of Syria from what the U.S. claim are Iranian-supported groups. Of course, Iranians are very clear they have nothing to do with them. Then we have seen a few U.S. attacks against these groups. 
Then we have seen some of these groups attacking Israeli positions in occupied Golan. And we have seen Israeli attacks against these groups and some Syrian government positions in Syria and increased Israeli attacks on different airports and positions inside of Syria. So the war is spreading. It's been an escalation. The question is now, can we contain it? Right. I, my, my opinion, but this is an opinion, and it's to be challenged, is that I do believe the Iranians do not want further escalation. I think they're playing with fire. Hmm? I think it's pretty clear Hezbollah do not want a full-scale war. As you alluded to, I, I was a UN envoy to Lebanon in 2006 and negotiated Security Council Resolution 1701, who is now sort of what we are discussing when it comes to the full implementation of that in Lebanon. Several details on that that I will not go into, but I think the question is what you said, and that is, will the Israelis stop in Gaza, or will it develop further? I, I, again, my personal opinion, this is also very clear that the Americans do not want this, but the question is, can the Israelis be contained? So I think for this to happen, we need a quick end to the war in Gaza, we need humanitarian assistance, and then we need to develop a strategy that is not only, and I know this is a tall order, but a strategy that do not only include Israel, Palestine, but the broader region. And later on, I have several ideas when it comes to this. Well, wonderful if we can come back to this. Just one quick question. This whole language of proxies and not proxies of Iran, how do you read the sense of independence of action of Hezbollah today compared to, let's say, previous years? obviously reinforced by the very important role they played in upholding the Assad government in Syria. Um, you know, heavily armed and increasingly armed, uh, involved in the government in Lebanon. Um, how much do you feel that Hezbollah is, has room for maneuver separate from Iran? And to what extent is it having to uphold its own position as the axis of resistance to retain its credibility inside Lebanon? In other words, is, is the escalation taking it beyond where it would like to go? You know, I'm, I'm hope, going to say I'm dealing with the Iranians more or less on a daily basis. Hmm? Uh, I, I do believe that obviously there is a very close relationship between Hezbollah and Iran. I think Iran accepts that Hezbollah is in its own right also a political entity in Lebanon that needs to make its own decisions. Right. But I do believe where we are now today this is a decision whether to go to a full-scale war or not. It's not a decision Hezbollah can make alone. Right. And that has to do, in my opinion, with the fact, of course, that Hezbollah is also, with the, for the Iranians, a deterrence. Hmm? Yeah. And the question is, when do you use and when do you not use that deterrence? Yeah. You certainly don't want to lose it if you're Iran Indeed. and have it uh, Indeed. Uh, destroyed Indeed. or hit. Yes. yes. Um, thank you. Karen, uh, let me come to you. I mean, you've got a lot of experience in the region. You've got a lot of experience on U.S. policymaking in the region and how they engage and do not engage uh, here. Obviously, the U.S. Um, involved almost in, in all aspects of this conflict, uh, involved in leading the military operation in the Red Sea, uh, involved um, uh, very much in what the future will be in the Hezbollah situation, obviously involved in, in Gaza and, and trying to put pressure on Israel. How do you think they're managing these risks of escalation? Um, which are their biggest areas of concern? How are they prioritizing them at the moment? Um, yeah, just share your thoughts sure. on this. Thank you, Robin, and thanks for inviting me to join today. Uh, look, in some ways, I think people overestimate what the United States can do in the region. Many people think that somehow Israel is like the 51st state, and of course it's not. It's an independent country, and the U.S. does what it can to put pressure on Israel, but it doesn't control what Israel does. I'm always surprised when I listen to the news and people say, well, you know, the U.S. needs to do this to tell Israel this and that. Um, but there is a lot to be worried about. I know the Americans behind the scenes have been working quite hard on not just pulling the coalition together to, to fight the Houthis uh, or to push back on, on and protect shipping in the Red Sea, but also to prevent 
a wider war in Lebanon later. I mean, don't forget, there are about 100,000 Israelis in hotels, Israelis who live on the border with Lebanon, um, and they will need security before they can go home. And this is why I'm concerned that Israel's plans are once, uh, once the fighting with Gaza is over, a bit of retrenchment, retrenchment, and then they will have to, if they feel that they're still insecure, they may feel they have to go to war at least on that border area. And so that is a big concern. I know that at the same time the U.S. is playing a pretty significant role in trying to prevent that from happening um, diplomatically. Those, the, the, the U.S. forces that are dotted around the region, yeah. we kind of had forgotten yeah. <laughs> that you have these elements still there, unless you're an expert following what's yeah. going on in the region. Are they now almost sort of hostages to escalation? Or do you think they're important uh, um, touch points that allow the U.S. to try to calibrate uh, preventing escalation while managing spread, if you see what I mean? Yeah, no, I mean, I see it as a deterrence. And if you listen to the language even yesterday with Jake Sullivan, he kept talking about deterrence and de-escalation. Um, I agree with Gara that Hezbollah, Iran, the United States, none of them want to expand this war, but you don't know what might prevent or what might uh, provoke uh, a country to, to do more. I mean, I was even surprised this morning. I woke up at 3 a.m. somehow, and I <laughs> wasn't even sure this was true, but Avali will share that Iran sent some missiles into Pakistan, which is, you know, that's a, a strange potential escalation. Anything like this could blow the region out of proportion and make it much more difficult. But at the same time, let's not, let's not forget that, you know, at least over the last decade, pretty much the majority of the countries in that region have been involved in some sort of civil war or regional war, whether it's Syria, Libya, Yemen, um, Qatar versus Saudi, um, troubles within Lebanon. And all of those conflicts have involved external forces supporting militaries and militias inside, and yet none of those did spill over. So I do think uh, everyone is very, very conscious of what war looks like because it wasn't so long ago that so many of these countries yep. were dealing with that, and no one wants to go back to that. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Valley, so many questions <laughs> about the Iranian thinking of position at a time of, yes, a leadership transition potentially mm -hmm. coming down the pike in, in Iran itself. But it, it strikes me that with the deal that had been done under Chinese auspices with Saudi Arabia, Iran was heading to a sort of place where there was a, a different future, one in which it was tacitly <laughs> observing the uh, JCPOA to, to kind of limit its nuclear enrichment, in which maybe there was some type of economic future for itself connected to China, maybe to Russia, maybe as, uh, in a more stable uh, Gulf region. All of that is gone, <laughs> it looks at, at the moment, or is it? So the question to you, is Iran um, welcoming? How is it able to use this moment? Um, is this a moment that it's trying to put the lid on because the old future is the one that they, they want to get back to, one of stability? Or is it a tiger they're having to ride that they have very little control over? How do you see, how do you think the Iranians see the situation right now? I mean, uh, I think the, their, their read of it would be, and not only them, but also the rest of the axis of resistance, but also, I think, other governments in the region, that the old order uh, is basically shattered. October 7th essentially ended the order that, you know, Saudi Arabia was thinking about normalization with, with Israel, was thinking about a shiny uh, economic boom uh, uh, in the Gulf. You know, th that whole order has fallen apart, not just because but of... Before it ever emerged. <laughs> Before it ever emerged. But, but if, we, if we went back to October 6th, as, as yeah. Gar said, we would see a very different Middle East. Now, uh, the new order isn't there, and I think the Iranians, Hezbollah, everybody is trying to sort of gain this. And as you, I mean, as you mentioned at the very beginning, uh, and Ger, Ger put it very well, we're seeing both escalation and spread of conflict. And I think the Iranians are trying to manage this. And, and I, it's important to note sort of what are they looking at and why they're acting the way they are. Mm. First of all, uh, uh, the war itself is escalating. There is, so long as Gaza war is not ended, it's not de-escalating. Yeah. And the next shoe is going to fall when, you know, the humanitarian crisis really hits hard. And, and, uh, and so long as the United States and Europeans, et cetera, don't have any plan for ending this war and Israel is not ready to do it, we are in an escalatory mode. So we shouldn't kid ourselves. Right. The war is ongoing. It's going through phases. It's not bombing. It's not starvation. 
uh, it's now humanitarian uh, crisis. Yep. Uh, so that's escalating. Secondly, uh, I, I know in the region is very firm belief that, that uh, the killing of uh, the Hamas leader in Beirut essentially ended an unwritten agreement that existed between Hezbollah and Israel that they would not attack one another's <laughs> capitals. So I think Hezbollah's view is actually that Israel is coming for it in a very big way. So it's not about whether Iran pushes the button. Israel, uh, Hezbollah itself is increasingly in a survival mode. Right. So it's not about uh, just acting on Iran's behalf. Uh, and we're also not out of the woods. I mean, Prime Minister Netanyahu keeps saying that, uh, that, it, that Hezbollah needs to go mm. uh, um, uh, you know, above the Litani River. And then he's going to ask for more things. It's not like they're going to stop if Hezbollah were even to, to go uh, north of the Litani River. As Gar said, we, we've seen uh, now much more direct U.S. involvement in Iraq, in Syria, and in, in Yemen. I, I think we are on a path for U.S. ending up in a war in Yemen. Uh, the mm -hmm. Blood has been drawn. The scale of attacks is there. The Houthis are not going to back down now. Uh, and and uh, we're, we're heading in that direction. And also, uh, Iraq may end up in a war. I mean, there's one of these missile exchanges between uh, U.S. And, and, and Iran that could uh, you know, go wrong and somebody can get killed, and we're going to be in a very different space. And even if nobody gets killed, if these continue, I think the stability of the Iraqi government yep. and the Iraqi system is now uh, in question, that can Iraq survive an escalated Iran-United uh, uh, States uh, uh, confrontation. Uh, and then uh, I would say it's not just that this conflict is spreading. Conflict is spreading, yeah. mm -hmm. and and so in the past, uh, you know, since we arrived in Davos, Iran has hit Erbil, yep. Iran has hit Pakistan. Before, just before we arrived, Iran captured the oil tanker uh, uh, on the Gulf, and Iran's nuclear program is now going to accelerate. Yep. Mm -hmm. Now, these are not technically, uh, you would say, Gaza, but but definitely, Iran is opening new fronts, and at the same time, there was also a massive bomb. Uh, that that uh, uh, went off in Iran, killing about 100 people. And even though officially, I, I think the Iranians accepted that it was ISIS, uh, um, because that sort of gives them cover not to have to react. But I think they don't believe that this is, uh, this is coincidental, that ISIS would carry out this attack in Iran uh, right in the middle uh, of, the, of the Gaza war. Mm -hmm. And, and so the question, the real question is, what's their end game? And I, and I think, you know, the, the, uh, for Iran and Hezbollah and, and now increasingly Houthis, the, they don't want Israel and the United States to dictate the pace of the Gaza war. You know, Israel finished Gaza on its own schedule and then decide what's going to happen after and then decide what they're going to do with Hezbollah and then what they're going to do with Houthis uh, and decide the end game, as you put it. Yeah. So, uh, uh, in a way, there, I, I don't think, uh, you know, sometimes we could become prisoner of our own words to yeah. talk about escalation, <laughs> suggest that, you know, the, 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 uh, you, could, you could also see one man's escalation is another man's deterrence, mm. yeah. uh, and one man's escalation, I think the Iranians and, and Hezbollah want to deny Israel and the United States the ability to dictate what's uh, the post, the, the new order that's going to emerge in the Middle East. And I think they're opening as many fronts at the same time mm -hmm. in, order to, uh, in order to deny Israel and the United States that capability. Yeah. I mean, you know, we constantly talk about Houthi-Iranian relationship, but it's very important to note Houthis are very close to, to, to Hezbollah. Yeah. Yeah. In some ways, more close to Hezbollah than they are to Iran. And that the Houthi escalation actually uh, got into full gear after the Israeli ass yeah. assassination yeah. of the Hamas leader. Yeah. In other words, once Hezbollah came to a belief that a, a, an expansion of war into Lebanon looks imminent, and Israel has not put aside the 2006 agreement, the Houthis opened the Red Sea front. Right. And, and so, so there, is a, there, is a, there is a logic here more than just wanton escalation. Mm. Yeah. Mm. We can see it's going to be so <laughs> difficult to do justice to, uh, mm. to all of these topics in the very limited time. I see we've got 20 minutes left, and I do want to leave 10 minutes for some questions. So. Please, uh, those of you who've got some ideas, please uh, have them ready and have them short and to the point, um, which would be uh, very helpful. Uh, let me uh, turn back to you, uh, Sarah Zubaydi, uh, Vice President. Um, let's get to the end game question. <laughs> what do you think this conflict is going to do to the future of Yemen? Uh, what will happen to the future of Yemen if, as we've heard from everyone here, the situation sounds like we're still in the escalation ladder? Uh, what does this mean for the future of Yemen, specifically? 
مستقبل اليمن مع وجود الحوثي والتهديد والتصعيد المستمر سيكون طبعا بانتظار كارثة إنسانية لم يسبق لها مثيل ونحن ندعو طبعا الولايات المتحدة والمجتمع الدولي إلى تشكيل يعني طبعا إلى تشكيل يعني مجموعات يعني لحماية باب المندب والممر الدولي هذا الآمن لأن ممر دولي يتبع الأمم المتحدة ومستفيد منه كثير من الدول الحوثي علينا أن نوجد استراتيجية ردع شاملة وكاملة في كافة مجالات السياسية والاقتصادية والعسكرية لأن أصبح يعني تهديد على المنطقة بشكل عام. And um, you, are you worried about an intensification of civil war inside the region as well? Inside Yemen, I mean. اليمن هناك طبعا ستكون يعني محافظات محررة بيد الحكومة الشرعية معظمها محافظة جنوبية وفي قضية جنوبية هناك طبعا ممكن يعني تتوسع الصراع وتعود إلى دولتين كما كانت من قبل 1990 إذا استمر الحوثي في يعني التصعيد في باب المندب والعمل بهذا الطريقة And part of what the Houthis seem to have done is um they are strengthening their credibility within Yemen and the region by supporting the Palestinian cause, should we say, certainly supporting the people in Gaza. <laughs> Does that make life more difficult, in a way, for the uh, Transitional Leadership Council? Well, <laughs> من ترويع للشعب الفلسطيني والانتهاكات الإنسانية فهذه تغطية واستثمار يعني لا يحق لو أن يستثمر الشعب الفلسطيني والقضية الفلسطينية وهذا يعني منش ليس من اختصاصه فهنا قيادة فلسطينية هي تهتم قضيتها طبعا no, Thank you very much, a very clear answer uh, Gia, let me pull you into that other area of your expertise which is Israel, Palestine I'm just going to ask you the question, end game What's the end game? Um, I'm sure you've got a very quick answer on that. But, uh... a, a, a very simple and quick answer is that there, if we want a solution to this crisis, the only way out of it is a two-state solution. Then, of course, everyone would argue that this is, for the time being, extremely difficult, and it has been proven elusive during the last 30 years. But I think what the 7th of October shows is that there is no way that the Palestinians and the Israelis are going to live together in one state. Hmm? So there is, there is, if there is no two-state solution, then there is a one-state reality that will be an apartheid state. And I think that should not be acceptable to anyone. So the point is, we need to make, you know, and here, I, I, you know, here is, is a challenge to my American friends. We need to stop talking about that there should be an horizon towards a two-state solution. Right, right. We need now to say there is no other way out of this than a two-state solution. And we've been waiting for 30 years. You know, my Palestinian friends that have been born after the Oslo Accords have been living in what they see as a one-state reality. Hmm? Because of that, they believe in the possible two-state solution has been diminished. Huh? Yeah. And I, you know, just an anecdote. When I, I lived in Jerusalem during the late 1990s and the beginning of 2000, at the time the support for Hamas was, yeah, let's say between 5 to 10 percent. And I remember in my discussion with my Israeli friends, they said, listen, start to take this seriously. If not, you will end up with Hamas as your interlocutor. Today, we have both Hamas and Fatah as realities, but we have other, also other sentiments. The question now is, if we don't deal with this now, Hamas and Fatah may be history. Right. There may be other things happening in Palestine that no one likes to see. And since this is my favorite topic that I'm not able to talk about every day, <laughs> let me just add one other thing. Of course, for this to become a reality, settlement activities needs to stop immediately. Hmm? And, and, and on this, there can't be any compromise. Hmm? There needs to be a very clear, and, and, and we, we know there are limits to what the Americans can do. 
then on this there needs to be a very, very clear statement. And if this doesn't stop, we basically what we're doing, we're undermining the possibility yep. to see that the end game will emerge. And this is in no one's interest. Yep. Ask me about Syria a little bit later. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we'll see. Hopefully you'll get a question on that. Um, uh, uh, all the things that Gear hasn't been able to cover, hopefully somebody will ask a question on that. So uh, let me turn to you now, uh, Karen. This conflict, this, the big question, is this... Does it have a geopolitical spillover? Um, where does the US play this with China? Are you expecting China to step up? There's no sign of their desire to do that at all at the moment. Russia seems to be keeping fairly quiet at the moment. Do you think this is fitting at all into the calculus of the Biden administration? They've got so much on their plate. Um, uh, yeah, how do, you, how do you see that? No, great question. Uh, the US has been trying to pivot to Asia for some time, all the way back to when I was in the Obama administration. And then, of course, it keeps getting distracted by events in the Middle East. Um, I don't speak for the US government, just to point that out. I just I worked for them years ago. But um, look, I think it's interesting to see that, uh, you know, watching Russia insert itself in September 2015, as Gare remembers when they arrived in Syria, militarily getting involved in the war, they made themselves indispensable in any conversations about peace um, in Syria going forward. China has been very involved in the region uh, financially, investments, and then of course they did this amazing rapprochement surprise really between Iran and Saudi Arabia. So it's quite interesting that neither of those countries are playing a, at least a, a role up front in terms of trying to push for a diplomatic solution to this challenge. I'm sure behind the scenes there's a lot going on that I don't know about, including, I'm sure, between the U.S. and uh, China in particular. But it is interesting that at the end of the day, the U.S. is still leading on diplomacy um, going forward. It's also interesting that, uh, as we've seen with the war in Ukraine, these wars are not contained, right? I mean, Ukraine has had a huge effect at the global level because of the spillover financially, because of you know food shortages, energy shortages, uh, the co economic challenges uh, from from that war, and then of course the Middle East because there's globally there's so much emotional investment in the region and in what's going on. We've seen protests all over the world, which you don't see for other conflicts. I mean, I don't know if anybody noticed, but in September. The Azerbaijanis basically pushed Armenia out of Nagorno-Karabakh, and I didn't see one protest in the streets about that. So, you know, these conflicts uh, do have a global spillover effect, and I think the Americans are very aware of that, and they're working very hard. The question is, how much leeway will they have, especially while Netanyahu is in power? And, and just on that, do you think the U.S. election at the end of this year serves as any kind of spur? Does that ever any kind of feed into um, uh, U.S. positions and, uh, uh, and the kind of action that, if this war is still going on, or some version of it, uh, you know, we're heading into November, October, November, do you think this is playing at all out in Washington? You know, I think in this particular case, it's different from Ukraine. Um, Trump, you know, obviously thinks he has a very special relationship with Netanyahu um, and, and with many Gulf leaders, um, but I, I don't think in this case that that is a factor right now. It's certainly a factor in Ukraine because of concerns about continued weapon supplies being yep. cut off. But I don't see it in the same way anyway. Um, Vali, let me come to you. Again, pick up any points you want. But you mentioned, uh, I won't say, well, I'm going to say it tantalizingly, <laughs> the um, massive increase in Iran's nuclear program since October the 7th, enrichment up to, uh, what, 90% now. I mean, a real <laughs> escalation of the situation compared to where it was before. Um, what does this tell you about Iran's uh, approach to future regional security? Have they now just decided any kind of relationship with the West, the future US government, Europe, is kind of, forget it, we now lean more on Russia, we lean more on China, we can pursue our own direction. Is that part of what's driving their uh, approach to this conflict? Well, I think in the, in the very short run, uh, uh, I, th I think it's a way of, uh, as I said, to spread the conflict. In other words, if we begin to read more news about 90% enrichment, then uh, that's going to become also uh, another topic the U.S. would have to address. Right. And then as... Uh, uh, that doesn't worry them, I mean... <laughs> no, because, because I think, you know, they, they, they've, uh, uh, their calculation of how far escalation would go 
uh, and uh, before there is an actually outright war, it might be very different uh, from ours. Yeah. And I think right now, um, you know, the, 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 this, the, I think the view of, of this axis of resistance is that it's going to be much worse for them to, to end up living in a, in a Middle East that is completely dictated by the U, by U.S. and Israel than, 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 uh, uh, than otherwise. Yeah. So, so I think they're exploring the margins, but, but, uh, and it's very clear in their strategy that they are, they are pushing. So, you know, attacks in Iraq, uh, capturing tankers, working with, with, their, with their allies in the region, and then the nuclear issue, all, all of the, which suggests that, you know, they're, they're trying to push the U.S. in, in all sorts of ways. Right. And one outcome of this is also to force the U.S. to change its Middle East policy. Yeah. I mean, it's now 100 percent, uh, you know, focused on supporting uh, Israel's uh, campaign in Gaza. So you have to see, it, from their point of view, how are you going to get the U.S. to change? And, and I think their calculation is that U.S. would respond only when it faces a threat of war or it faces a grave situation. There's no diplomatic path between them, them right. and the U.S. And, but I also think that if they see a Middle East in which they're going to be in a much more uh, aggressive posture with Israel, which I think is inevitable, that you know, this war, if anything, has raised uh, the, the possibility of a direct confrontation between the two of them in the no next five years, several notches up, that you know, having nuclear capability is now more important to them <coughs> than, than it, was, uh, it was before. I don't think the door on you know, possibility of uh, a, a nuclear agreement is 100% closed. But, you know, it's only a sliver of light left. Okay. Mm. And nothing's going to happen in this year because right. it's election year. So I think their calculation be if there's going to be a le uh, talks with the next administration in the U.S., it's much better if they have, their, have a lot more leverage at that point, more stockpiles of nuclear weapons, more centrifuges, exactly. et cetera. And, and Gaza is a perfect cover. I mean, we don't, yeah. the, Israel doesn't have a bandwidth to threaten bombing Iran right now, and nor does, nor does the U.S. So, so they're taking advantage of that as well. Okay, bleak enough for everyone in the room. Um, so let's take some questions. We've literally got eight minutes left, so please uh, quickly introduce yourselves. I've got two hands going up. I might take them as a group, three hands, four. Right, that, I might even have to stop there. Uh, so uh, if you want to direct them to one of the speakers, obviously that would be helpful. Please say who they are. Very quickly say who you are as well, uh, and let's take it. So first, the two ladies there, the one on the left, my left, and then I'll come to the gentleman here, and then I'll come to the other lady next to you, and then there was another hand somewhere around here. Sorry, you're first. Yeah, you with the microphone. Yes, please. Hi. Um, this. Are you saying that? Hi. Uh, this question is for Karen. Um, I'm a young person representing the Global Shapers community of young leaders. Um, this is uh, regarding the comment about uh, Israel not being a 51st state. Um, I just wanted to comment, um, it's, uh, the U.S. is still heavily funding the Israeli military, uh, including a $14 uh, billion aid package, which uh, largely funded weapons um, contributing uh, to uh, the genocide. Um, but U.S. citizens, like you said, are marching uh, throughout the country um, uh, opposing this. Um, and as a young person uh, who hopes for a future um, of peace, um, what do you think the U.S. government's uh, end game is here um, uh, right. for the war? Uh, uh, as a young person, we hope for a future without war and for peace and for a future where all young people um, can live <clears throat> in harmony. And so uh, I just hope that you can answer this question for us. Thank you. And Karen, hold your thoughts uh, replying that, because that's a very important question that needs probably a bit of reflection on how you want to answer it. The gentleman here? Yep, please. Uh, the microphone is going to come to you. Yeah, the second lady. Oh. Um, I tell you what, I'll take the second question there, because the microphones can stay together. Sorry, I apologize. Yeah. No, no problem. My name is Rana Dejani. I'm a professor from Jordan. I'm originally Palestinian and Syrian, as most of the region. My question is to all the panelists. Uh, with, following up on the earlier question, with all the disconnect, uh, disconnect from the whole globe marching against the genocide unfolding in Gaza, which is the root cause of all of this, by the way, uh, uh, how, and the loss of faith in international law and equality of human life, demonstrated very much by Western governments uh, supporting the Ukraine but not supporting Gaza, uh, only uh, coming to attack the Houthis when they're... Uh, uh, um, uh, their, their concerns and powers is, is in question. So, and the stepping in of South Africa to file the complaint in the ICJ for the genocide, how do you see a shift of power in right. the world from the global right. north to the global south? And is this, and BRICS, and how is that going to um, contribute to the end game? Thank you. Thank you. Um, somebody could bring a microphone here to the front here. 
Well, I'll start. No, here it is. Here it is. Please, microphone. Yep, to that person. Thank you very much. So my perspective is that of a former, Who are you? A former Iraqi ambassador okay. to the United States. I'm currently the climate envoy. Could you all stand up? Yeah. Um, I'm older than the people who spoke, so I remember things having read about them. Um, there is a precedent where the United States intervened forcefully to force Israelis to withdraw, and that's the Suez crisis. Suez crisis. Yes. Right. And, what I, and, I'm, and what I'm surprised about is that nobody has picked this up. <laughs> Many years ago, I had an argument with Flora Lewis, which really dates me, uh, about history. And she said, comparison et parison. To her, I answered, not necessarily. My question to you, uh, to the panelists, is why can't President Biden be more like President Eisenhower and force a withdrawal of the Israelis? Uh, That's a big question, but a very interesting one. Right. I think, as I can't see the fourth hand anymore, I'm, and we're very tight on time. Oh, very quick. Sorry, just there. Yeah, if you can take it down to the front row. Very quickly, if you don't mind, sir. Yeah, actually, as I can see, this is a humanitarian issue, not a political thing. Uh, end game for the Palestinians. I think you asked the same. What is the end game for the Palestinians? Because you're talking about when Israel ends the Gaza issue. OK, what about the Palestinians? Thank you. Thank you. Right, um, we've got big questions. Let me give an opportunity for each of you to say something. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it very, very difficult for you. Because at the <laughs> end of your answer uh, to the questions, I want to, you to give me a number. OK? You have to give me a number. <laughs> number one is, at the end of this year, we're still roughly in the situation we're in now. Yeah? That is the end game going into 2025. That's number one. Uh, number two is actually there's a breakthrough. Some type of move towards greater stabilization, including on the Palestinian issue. We've got some sort of ceasefire. That's number two. Number three is where uh, Valley was taking us. Actually, the end game of this is Israel versus Iran at some level. Um, yeah, I'll let you define how that is, but that it escalates to a point where they each feel that they've made each other so insecure. That's number three. That has impacts, obviously, on the whole region. So um, sorry to put you in that position, Vice President. If you don't want to take a number, you don't have to. <laughs> but um, but uh, uh, I'll let you maybe answer that question, and then some of the others have questions about Palestine and US policy. And we only have two and a half minutes, theoretically, to do this. Thing. That's why I'm giving you numbers. أنا 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 أتفق مع المتحدثين أن الشعب الفلسطيني بحاجة إلى قامة دولة مستغلة وبإمكاننا الرجوع إلى المبادرة العربية التي قدمها الملك الراحل عبد الله بن عبد العزيز وهي من توجد الرقم اثنين في حالة الاستقرار بإذن الله تعالى. Choose number two. I've got a tick next to two. Thank you very much. Please. I choose number four. And number four is the following. What we're seeing. Playing out in in Gaza is basically the old world order, some way or another, <clears throat> coming towards an end. Right. What we are seeing in Syria is that the new world order is not in place. Hmm? Yeah. But it's a place where no one can dictate the outcome. And I remind you, in Syria there are five foreign armies. Yeah. It's a place where the, where the Iranians, the Russians, the Americans. The Israelis are on the same territory, and they're not capable of working out a vision together on how to solve this. And I think of a message, as my message is and needs to be, is that none of you, when it comes to this world, can <laughs> dictate the outcome of the conflict. There needs to be some kind of a compromise, some kind of working together. And I believe what we are seeing in Gaza is making that more difficult. Right. And that's why we may have a spillover along the line that Wally was mentioning. Right. But the point is, there is a way out of this if there is a political willingness. And on this, we need another panel. Yes. <laughs> that sounds like a two to me, but that's all right. I'm <laughs> going to let you have your four. Um, please, over to you, Karen. Briefly on these two yeah, questions. Yeah, exactly. Very good questions. I think people always overestimate U.S. influence when it gives countries money. And Valley can tell you better than anyone. The U.S. gave a lot of money to Pakistan over many years and was, had very little leverage on what Pakistan could do. 
So while you think it should be easier, it's not so easy to, to change the, the rules and withdraw the money. It gets very complicated. Um, but they do have influence. They just don't have as much as people think. And then to your point, and I'm agreeing with Gare, I think you're absolutely right, that the world has changed. We don't know what the new order is going to be. Neither the United States nor China can tell countries what to do. Yeah. And smaller countries are asserting themselves in ways yeah. we haven't seen before, which is very good, actually, for the global order. But we don't quite know how it will settle out. Finally, I'm a two only because I'm an optimist. And I read an article that said optimists live longer than pessimists. <laughs> and, and optimists are happy until they're depressed. So I'm going to be happy until I get depressed. OK. Um, Fali, over to you. Last words. So uh, I would say uh, to the questions that were raised here that yeah. for the first time, global public opinion is an actor here. Mm. I mean, if so, that's one of the things that actually can force a change in the United States and Israel uh, as well. And if you listen to Hassan Nasrallah's speech of January 3rd, you could see how much emphasis he was putting on, on global public, public opinion. Secondly, um, I would say that, uh, as Gare said earlier, unless the United States looks beyond just Gaza and looks beyond what happens in Gaza and thinks about a, a, a much broader sense of regional security, then we're on number five. And I would also say that one conclusion of this um, panel should be that the job of managing all of this should be given to Gare. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and what's your number? <laughs> what's your number? One, two, five. Oh, that was... <laughs> we, we, I, I'm never gonna, conditional <laughs> five. I'm never going to try numbers again. That was a failure. Um, but uh, thank you very much. Look, that we covered an enormous amount of issues. We've only got a minute and a half over time. Um, uh, and so could you please join me in thanking an excellent panel and thank you for coming. Thank you.